A good morning from uh, the IISS in Washington, D.C. Um, a warm welcome to today's webinar on Israel and Palestine conflict at 75, the domestic and regional landscape. My name is Benjamin Petrini. I'm a research fellow in the Conflict Security and Development Program uh, here at IISS. Our program monitors armed conflicts globally and domestic instability, and we analyze the implications on countries' trajectories and on countries' peace tra tra trajectories and on international security. Our team curates the IISS flagship publication on armed conflict survey. We are at the 2022, edi 2022 edition that we just published a couple of months ago. And this is where this uh, webinar series uh, emanates, where we uh, analyze uh, uh, different armed conflicts uh, globally. Now, it is a very timely discussion today, given all the turmoil that is happening, happening on the domestic front in Israel and the escalation of violence. And for uh, practitioners uh, like me, um, the Israelo-Palestinian conflict has sort of like defined the landscape of, of armed conflict in the 20th century, but also defies uh, categorizations and, and typology, um, being at a mix between an intrastate conflict and an interstate conflict. Um, very quickly, we will follow, before I introduce the speakers, we will follow three lines of discussion today. Um, the first one is on the present uh, political fracture uh, in Israel, where the Netanyahu's government is conducting a political battle against the judiciary and the Supreme Court, uh, seeking to introduce reforms to limit the judiciary independence. This process is uh, crucially seeking to redraw the balance of power between executive and judiciary, as in, and it is steering widespread public protest, with many arguing that the very fate of democratic institutions are at stake um, in the country. Just last Sunday, Israeli President Herzog warned about the perils of an imminent, quote, constitutional and social collapse, uh, end of quote. The second line of discussion is about the status of the conflict and the escalation uh, during 2022 and presently in 2023. We have been witnessing some of the highest violence on both sides in the West Bank and um, in Israel's territory, so with, with escalating violence from both sides. And we will also analyze and look at the, at the implications of, obviously, of Israeli's turmoil on the conflict. And lastly, we want to account for the regional environment and the international dimensions. And big changes also have taken a place here as well in the last few years um, after the Abraham Accords. And, and we can argue that the conflict is no longer the axis of equilibrium for regional stability or instability in the Middle East. But enough with me and let's, let's now hear from the experts. I have, uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming uh, in order of appearance uh, Noah Schusterman is a researcher and the Israeli-Palestinian Re Research Program Coordinator at the Institute for National Security Studies at Tel Aviv University. Um, we have Dr. Nathan Brown, professor at Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University, and has other affiliations. He's on the Board of Trustees at American University in Cairo, and is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And last but not least, Khaled Elgindi is a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute where he directs the program on Palestine and Israeli-Palestinian affairs. He's the author of the book, Blind Spot, America and the Palestinians from Balfour to Trump. Before we begin, let me um, just remind you about the marching order. We will have introductory remarks by the three speakers and uh, followed by a moderated discussion and Q&A. Um, there, uh, there is a button at the bottom of, uh, of your screen um, where you can put your, uh, your question in writing and I will refer the question um, to the speakers. Now, let me start with, uh, with, with Noah, 
uh, Noah Schusterman. So you, you are a contributor to, the, to our armed conflict survey and to our uh, IISS um, publications. Can you recap for us a bit where we stand on the armed conflict today and the different landscape and some of the trends in the conflict? Over to Hi. you. Yeah. Hi, Benjamin, and hello, everyone. It's nice to be here. Um, so th this would be a very, um, I don't know, if interesting recap, but we're at a very interesting uh, period where we'll discuss this later. But looking forward, it's there are a lot of questions of where exactly is this going to go. <laughs> Uh, but looking back at uh, 2022 and also the beginning of 23, um, these are very tumultuous times. Um, so you can sort of pinpoint it, um, the current trends to March 2022, and when where we saw a spike in terrorist activities um, in Israel proper. So um, we've seen this maybe more in the past, but this is something that wasn't really um, experienced in the past few years is um, gun violence um, and stabbings happening um, in Tel Aviv, in Bnei Brak, in Ahmad Gan, so uh, cities that are very central and very highly populated within Israel. Um, and this, of course, um, brought a lot of attention from Israelis. There were events happening, violent events happening in the West Bank between settlers and Palestinians before that. Um, but it's important to state that when it happens in the West Bank, which is an area that from the Israeli point of view is less populated, it's more um, controversial than the Israeli, it's not so much in the Israeli mainstream. So once the violence reached into Israel proper, then really it had a lot of uh, echo um, and Israel initiated an operation that it called breaking waves, meaning the wave of violence, um, thus entering military force, Israeli military force into what we consider as area A uh, in the Palestinian territories, mostly in Jenin. So Jenin refugee camp, which a um, few of the uh, militants, a few of the terrorists who attacked in, uh, in Israel during these months came from Jenin. Um, and what we saw really interesting is that this operation did not really lower the flames. We didn't see less violence, but actually more militants were um, growing. And we saw actually new organizations that were building up. Um, the most prominent one that uh, people talk about is called Lion's Den. So this is a really new organization. Um, mostly young folks unaffiliated with a specific uh, Palestinian organization uh, who mostly target military um, military targets, so not so much civilian, and work predominantly in the West Bank and not in Israel proper. And this organization also had other um, organizations kind of spurring up and trying to, uh, were inspired by it. Uh, we saw it in, the, in, um, in Nablus, uh, now also in Jericho. So this is a new phenomenon. Um, and breaking and, and then this breaking waves operation, um, you can actually say that maybe it wasn't as successful because we didn't really see it's actually still to this day, Israel is still continuing in the same trend in terms of um, military operations inside Janin and inside Nablus um, and inside uh, now there was a um, an, um, an event in Jericho. Uh, so it's not really subsiding. And there's a question of whether or not this is actually able to uh, lower the flames. Uh, also worth mentioning is what Israel called Operation Breaking Down, which happened in um, August. So this was a targeted operation in the Gaza Strip, three days um, of air, uh, air strikes in the Gaza Strip. Um, against uh, rockets that were fired. This was mostly targeting um, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, so not Hamas. Hamas did actually set this one out and did not participate in the uh, firing of rockets. Um, and the fighting took, um, took place for only three days, so this was a very short uh, period of time. Um, and then it subsided. And it had a bit of ripple effect in the West Bank, but not something that was uh, very... Um, partly uh, felt. Um, 
And it's it's important to say that by the end of 2022, this was really a very violent and deadly year um, to the extent that we haven't seen in, in years. So there were 31 Israelis that were uh, killed um, in Israel, and there were 154 Palestinians that were killed only in the West Bank. So I'm, I'm putting an emphasis on this because unlike uh, operations that we've seen with really a, a very high toll in the Gaza Strip, um, this time the focus was actually on the West Bank, which traditionally in the past 10 years has actually been much more calm uh, and much more stable. So we see a very important, this shift is very important to mention. Um, and I think uh, just one last remark is, of course, it's important to um, to raise the issue of the Israeli elections, which took place in November. And by the end of December, there was a new government in Israel that was sworn in. And this government has very alt-right uh, elements to it, very nationalist um, right-wing elements that are very much... Um, don't want to call it anti-Palestinian because it's not only about anti-Palestinian, but they're Jewish nationalists. So their aspirations are to really enlarge um, Israel and to annex the West Bank fully. Um, they have territorial um, demands over this area. Um, they don't believe that a Palestinian state should and could ever um, be established. Um, and now they have very strong um, hold in the government, also on the levers of power, which I think we will discuss this issue of Israeli politics uh, later. Uh, but this really does affect how, looking forward, what's the ability of the Israeli establishment to um, you know, withstand and, and manage the turmoil that is already happening as that has been building up for this past year. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Noah, for uh, for the recap of the the main dimensions and the main trends. And um, yes, I, as as some of the statistics and the trends uh, have been noted, uh, some of the violence in the West Bank we have not seen this level of violence uh, since uh, the end of the Second Intifada in in two thousand and five. So we are really in some unprecedented territory. Um, let me welcome uh, Khaled Elgindi that was able to uh, join us. Uh, good morning, Khaled. Um, can I ask you to speak about the conflict from the, the Palestinian side and some of the uh, reflections on, on, on the Palestinian domestic politics, uh, this power succession, um, and, and give us a bit of flavor where, um, where the conflict stands on that side today. Great, thank you, and apologies for I had some uh, technical difficulties joining, but I'm glad to to be with you this morning. Um, so, so let me let me start off by uh, by sort of stipulating that there's actually con some uh, considerable debate as to whether the term conflict uh, uh, correctly or appropriately can be applied to the situation between Palestinians and Israelis. Um, my own view is uh, I think it is a conflict, but uh, but it is also much more than that. Uh, for example, it is also an occupation uh, where one party militarily, as well as economically, politically, uh, and otherwise dominates uh, the other side that it is supposedly negotiating uh, with or in, in a dispute over territory with. Uh, it is also, I think, a settler colonial project uh, in which the dominant group, uh, Israeli Jews, are actively involved in uh, the territorial and demographic engineering through the importation of Israeli settlers into occupied territory and the displacement of, of Palestinians in various uh, communities, particularly in Jerusalem, but also in parts of the West Bank. And for some, uh, especially human rights groups, it is uh, also a system uh, of apartheid that en enshrines this dominance and equality as a matter of legal and political, uh, as part of the legal and political governance regime. Um, I think it can be all of these things and still be a conflict, uh, but whichever lens I think one chooses to use, it has to be seen and dealt with uh, as the highly uh, asymmetrical conflict 
that it is, uh, though that is not typically how the peace process as, uh, uh, as we once called it has, has generally dealt with it. Um, this massive and growing asymmetry is in fact one of the key drivers of conflict. Uh, and violence, as one party has both the power and the incentive to impose its will through force of arms uh, on the ground, while the weaker party looks for ways to uh, resist, sometimes through violence, sometimes not. Occupation, I think, should be, uh, should be remembered, is inherently violent. Um, so it is inevitable that resistance will, uh, 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 at some point, also uh, use violence. Uh, the conflict itself has undergone, I think, a number of different phases. Uh, we've seen two major uprisings. We've seen a process, a peace process that has uh, come and gone. Um, we've seen, uh, as I said, uprisings, one armed and one not uh, armed. Uh, I think in, in 2006 and seven, uh, shortly after the second intifada, um, and especially after Hamas won elections in 2006, I think the conflict entered a new phase. Since then, I think Israel has been very effective at fragmenting and compartmentalizing Palestinians territorially, politically, but also militarily between Gaza and the West Bank, between uh, the West Bank and Jerusalem, and even uh, within the West Bank itself. Um, this uh, uh, so what we've seen is a kind of periodic eruptions of violence uh, in Gaza uh, that tend to be uh, contained there in East Jerusalem, um, but we don't see a sort of mass mobilization across, or we haven't seen so far a mass mobilization that has crossed over into all of the occupied territories. With one exception, in May uh, 2021, uh, what Palestinians refer to as the unity intifada, uh, but but this was, I think, a, a limited initiative, maybe a sign of what's to come, but but not something that I think um, has uh, has staying power. Um, uh, to, you know, to to sustain a long term mobilization really requires a kind of a political and logistical coherence that just doesn't exist right now on on the Palestinian side. So. Um, all of this, this fragmentation and compartmentalization, of course, is very much by design, such that we have separate and distinct conflicts, uh, uh, as it were, in Gaza, uh, between Gaza and Hamas. And you'll often see analysis and uh, commentary that there's a, a Hamas-Israel conflict, um, as opposed to an Israeli-Palestinian conflict that is that has different uh, theaters of operation or different manifestations. Um, it's not uncommon even to see Israel engaging in peace talks uh, with one set of Palestinians, for example, the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank, while simultaneously making war against another set of Palestinians, uh, namely uh, in Gaza. We saw this in 2008 and, and, and 2014. Um, of course, the notion uh, is utterly absurd in terms of conflict resolution or conflict mitigation and yet both the international community and the Palestinian leadership have generally acquiesced in this, in this sort of fragmented reality. Um, so in my opinion, I, I, I think the conflict is now entering a new and uh, probably more dangerous phase. Uh, for all intents and purposes, I think both Hamas and Gaza, uh, Hamas in Gaza and the PA in the West Bank have been effectively neutralized in their respective spheres. Um, in the sense that whatever threats they may pose, whether military on the part of Hamas or political and diplomatic on the part of uh, Abbas's leadership in the West Bank, um, can generally be uh, managed or contained by Israel. Um, meanwhile, since 2014, we've seen a proliferation in Palestinian protest and resistance movements, in part because of this this neutralization of, of the, the key political actors. Uh, many of these began as nonviolent movements, demonstrations around Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem, recurring protests around settlements and the wall, uh, the Gaza March of Return. Um, in almost all of these cases, uh, Israel has responded with 
uh, with violence. Um, at the same time, we've seen a ramping up of armed and other violent attacks, including things like car rammings and stabbings, occasional shootings, uh, and more recently, the emergence of new armed groups. Uh, these new attacks do not come from the traditional actors like Hamas or Al-Aqsa Martyr Brigades, uh, but generally by lone wolf actors, individuals who are carrying out acts that are not directed by a major faction or, or political or military group, um, but also new groups like uh, the Lion's Den and the Janine Brigades in the Northern West Bank uh, who have uh, uh, concentrated most of their, uh, their efforts at attacking Israeli checkpoints and soldiers, uh, as well as occasionally uh, Israeli settlers. Um, so what that means is that the usual chain of command uh, is not there or is, is just not clear. Uh, that is, it's not clear who it is. It, it, there's no one to pick up the phone and say, all right, guys, we need to tamp this down in exchange for some sort of political negotiation um, as part of a broader de-escalation. I think this danger is exacerbated by three simultaneous developments, the fragmentation, weakness, uh, and increasingly illegitimate, uh, the, 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 I should say, the uh, declining legitimacy of the Palestinian leadership. Uh, I think Mahmoud Abbas's leadership is increasingly not only unpopular, but it is also increasingly irrelevant, both in political and, and security terms. Uh, there are parts of the West Bank that the Palestinian security forces don't go uh, in, in the North in particular. Um, the second uh, uh, major development is, uh, of course, the extremist government uh, in Israel, which is committed to uh, accelerating all these points of conflict uh, from settlements to evictions, to arrests, to the, the greater frequency of using deadly force. Um, and none of the usual constraints are there. Uh, I, I think what is fundamentally different about this government is you have now elements inside the cabinet who have direct responsibility uh, over life in the occupied territories, like Ben Gvir and Smotrich, um, who are themselves committed to dismantling uh, the Palestinian Authority uh, and any vestige of, of a future Palestinian state. Um, the third, I think, dangerous trend that we're seeing is, is general international in disinterest and disengagement. Um, and so what that essentially does is, is it leaves the parties to their own devices and, and essentially at the mercy of the hugely asymmetrical uh, power realities on the ground which, which in my view, I, I think is a recipe for, uh, we're probably going to see a much more, uh, uh, much more violence. So if 2022 was the deadliest year for Palestinians in the West Bank, uh, 2023 is, is already uh, uh, on pace to, to outstrip uh, last year in terms of uh, uh, how, how bloody it's, it's, it's been. So unfortunately, I think the prognosis is not very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for starting actually on 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 how um, the, 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 that that's what I said at, at the beginning before you you were able to join on how the definition and the classification of the armed conflict in of, of Israel and Palestinian territories is one that really defies uh, classifications and, and and easy categorization, not as if there is one conflict that that is easy to classify. Um, um, the, this, this point that you made about the fragmentation of violence and the fragmentation of armed actors and how that reflects on the prospects of peace or negotiations is, I think, is a very uh, important one. Let me um, go back to uh, Noah Schusterman. Um, can you uh, tell us a bit about what uh, are the main uh, uh, points of contention in uh, Israeli domestic politics today, and especially how they reflect uh, on the on the armed conflict. Yeah, so I think anyone who follows the the region and especially Israel knows that at the moment the focal point is actually Israeli domestic politics. Um, it's the judicial reform or ju judicial revolution, uh, the regime revolution, some call it uh, within Israel. Um, so 
the Minister of, um, of Legal Affairs is uh, trying to push for a very, very vast uh, and substantial reform in the, so it's not only about the Supreme Court, but at the end of the day, what they really care about is how it affects the Supreme Court. Um, because the Supreme Court as it is, is a barrier and still an obstacle for some of the policies that um, that the right-wingers would like to see. So the Supreme Court is very much characterized as, as a leftist because it is uh, sort of like the last guard of uh, human rights, um, very much um, you know in line with um, um, equality, um, and really, in many times, it was the last obstacle um, and kind of um, the way to really, um, um, really just uh, um, go back on, on very harsh policies that the that the government tried to either legislate or to enact. Um, and also in referral to uh, settlements. So let's say um, a new settlement that was established and was on a uh, Palestinian private property, then the Palestinians had the options of appealing to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court can uh, order an evacuation. And then that land is evacuated. And it's worth saying that even today there was actually an evacuation of an illegal outpost um, in the West Bank. Um, so, that is a very uh, significant reform that's uh, really being implemented as we speak. And there's a very large movement within Israel. And just this uh, Monday, we saw very, um, I think it was, uh, there are debates about how many people actually attended the uh, um, the protest, but it, it's been discussed between 100,000 people or 300,000 people um, that attended that actually went to Jerusalem during the day. Um, so they took off work. Um, many of the high tech sec people from the high tech sector decided to join this um, and they're going against um, the reform because they see it as um, infringing on Israeli democracy. It's also really important to say that this is not seen as something that's connected to the Palestinian issue. It's very, it's very much framed as a domestic issue on Israeli democracy. And if you look at how it's also framed in the Israeli media, the, the Palestinian issue is not really mentioned, it's not discussed, it's not seen as something that's connected in any way to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but more of a struggle on the character of the state. So Israel characterizes itself as Jewish and democratic, um, and there's always this um, the question of balance. So if I said the Supreme Court as taking the stand that um, traditionally it safeguards the, de the, the democratic elements of it. And if you look at what the reform tries to do, it really gives more gravitas to the Jewish tradition. Um, and at the end of the day, how could this really make an impact on the conflict? Maybe not tomorrow, but long term, it will mean that there are judges in, um, in the Supreme Court that when a case is brought to them and they now have to say whether or not this uh, settlement needs to be evacuated or, or uh, reparations to, um, to Palestinians um, whose land was uh, taken from them. So they would have then, uh, those uh, Supreme Court judges would then need to, uh, to make a ruling and that ruling would be based on basically a new balance between the, the Jewish and democratic character. Um, so that's one very important element, and it's also important to say that within the, the structure of this government, there has been changes um, that members of the coalition have really demanded, so Smotrich and Benville have really demanded to have um, vast um, authorities that um, give them more power when it comes to uh, either uh, expansion of settlements or um, when Ben Gvir has been actually, he asked to uh, change his uh, ministry from Ministry of Interior to Ministry of National Security because he wants also to uh, work on issues that have to do with the um, Arab Israeli um, sector within Israel. Um, that now is suffering from a rise of uh, the 
there's more crime associated with that sector in Israel, um, a lot of illegal weapons. So there's really, in the Israeli point of view, there's really a disconnect between the conflict and the domestic issues. But if you take a step back and, and have more of a academic outlook or a research uh, uh, point of view, then really these two are, at the end of the day, they're very much connected because the, um, the parties that are pushing for these policies, their agenda is more Jewish, um, settlement expansion, um, really taking over the West Bank. And I agree with Khaled that at the end of the day, they want to see, to see the Palestinian Authority disintegrate not from their own doing. So they don't want to be seen as responsible for this. They want this to happen because of the palace, because of the Palestinians unable to control their own people and unable to uh, can, to really um, uh, ensure the viability of the Palestinian Authority. Um, but just one last remark bef um, before I finish is, there's a big question of where does Netanyahu stand on this? Because, um, you can say and you can argue that he's actually the one who's trying to uh, steer to the left or not to the left, but steer to the center uh, because he's much more connected to uh, uh, US policies and to US uh, decision makers. And he realizes the threats um, of really going down the road of Smotrich and Benkville. And we saw the, this week just a visit by Blinken and by uh, um, this month's um, also President Biden. Um, so they have a very strong stance when it, when it comes to uh, settlement expansion. Um, and also I would even say that he cares not more, but quite um, comparatively uh, UAE and the uh, new members of the Abraham Accords. So that's part of his legacy. That's something that he pushed very strong for. And basically he proved to the world that you can bypass the Palestinian issue, that you can make, that Israel can make peace with the Arab world without the Palestinians. And that is something that he's not going to forgo so easily. So he's really, he understands the, the repercussions of what's happening with his coalition. And he's trying to keep the hands on the wheel and really make sure that he's steering to the left or to the center and not letting them wreak havoc and destroy his legacy. Thank you very much. I, I, I get a lot from, uh, from your remarks and this uh, progressive erosion of the Palestinian Authority. It seems like a deliberate uh, project from some, some of the side in Israel to, uh, that to, to have, not to have a counterpart um, in, uh, in any possible negotiation and, and, and in a way to uh, put the conflict more on the on the on the regional level and and with other domestic uh, domestic implications, um, I'll I'll turn I'll turn to uh, Dr. Nathan Brown um, to talk to us about the international dimensions uh, of the conflict and what is uh, what is currently at stake and what has changed uh, in the last few years. <clears throat> sure. Thank you very much. Um, there has been a lot already said. Um, so I think what I'll try to do is contribute by looking sort of from the outside in, uh, but also because I think I'm probably the oldest panelist, um, inject just a quick historical note as well. Um, back in the 20th century, for those of us who remember, there was something called peace process uh, that had identifiable actors. They were generally state actors. There was a series of UN Security Council resolutions. There were specific diplomatic processes, sometimes named after European cities like Geneva or Madrid or Oslo. Um, that, that was really about uh, not simply managing, but about resolving uh, a, an Arab-Israeli conflict. That began to change a little bit, especially in the 1990s with peace agreements between Israel and some Arab states, but also with the Oslo Accords that brought in the uh, uh, the PLO and the Palestinians as 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 uh, as an actor, and then about two decades ago, not before that, um, an international consensus arising about a what was called a, a two state solution that there would be an Israeli state and a Palestinian state, um, and 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 the idea of some kind of negotiation to uh, to bring that about. Um, that's actually much more recent, I think, than a lot of people remember, but it, but it still was something that there was an international mechanisms or set of international mechanisms, with the quartet and so on, 
and UN Security Council resolutions, um, multilateral negotiations in order to uh, uh, to bring about. Um, that is all gone. I mentioned that history because it still colors people's memories and sometimes people's sort of policy uh, policy inclinations, uh, but essentially it is erased. Um, the United States is simply less of an actor now, in, 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 and, and it really uses whatever attention it uh, does give to simply managing the conflict and 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 and. Uh, uh, preventing violence, that sort of thing. Um, there's no real conflict resolving to, uh, process on right now. There are sort of ad hoc or, or lower level diplomatic processes between the United, uh, between Israel and, and, and uh, the Palestinian Authority, um, and actually probably a more viable one between Israel and Hamas, but those are really designed about managing things on a day-to-day -day basis, not about resolving the conflict. The decay of the Palestinian leadership um, that has come up in, in both Noah's and Khaled's uh, uh, comments, um, I think is not a process it's happened, and it's been it's it was a process that has taken place over a couple decades. But but there now simply is not a, a Palestinian leadership. There are people occupying positions, formal positions, but they can't lead. Um, there's a rise of regional powers within the region that be, simply become more significant actors, um, and that have their own kind. They don't necessarily frame their policies in terms of you know in the 20th century the cold war or or american hegemony after that uh, but really kind of pursue their own policies and the abraham accords have also i think simply meant that the idea of this as an interstate conflict or that is the primary focus of attention um, is simply outmoded. It certainly is an international issue, but it's not an interstate conflict, getting back to uh, how, how you uh, originally, um, uh, 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 the questions you originally asked. So um, at this point, what I would say is the conflict has metastasized. It is not about an international war, but about inter intractable conflict. Uh, Non-state actors are, are simply much, much more important, especially on the Palestinian side. Um, uh, um, as, as has been um, uh, described, there's no real diplomatic process. There's an Israeli leadership, I think, right now that has no interest in a negotiated settlement with a Palestinian national movement. Um, and the question that we've heard debated is um, sort of from the uh, in, in terms of the Israeli leadership, do we um, negotiate with kind of the rump leadership that is still there or at least allow essentially is a status quo um, uh, uh, good enough for now or do we actually undermine this annex um, and 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 stop even pretending that the Palestinian leadership is is a leadership. I think the um, the, the result is 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 not a stable result. But you know, if I go back in half a century, was the last time that really major international interstate conflict was sort of on the agenda. If you remember the seventy three war, you know, American Soviet confrontation. So on, that's not happening. Um, but what I would go back to May 2021 and see it not necessarily as a blueprint for what will be repeated, but essentially the future of the conflict. In May 2021, you had violence beginning in Jerusalem, spilling over to the West Bank, spilling over into mixed um, um, Israeli-Palestinian cities or Jewish-Palestinian, uh, Israeli cities with mixed Jewish and Palestinian populations, um, you know, sometimes even fights within uh, or uh, with it within the same apartment building um um and you really had as i said sort of a conflict that has metastasized to look a little bit more like um uh you know uh, conflicts like Kashmir and 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 so on um the idea of using an apartheid lens which used to be kind of on the fringe of of analysis of the conflict has now moved to the center um and uh when people uh, talk uh talk about it so my sense is that what you have is a conflict that is inherently unstable it is a uh a, a, as Khaled says sort of a set of different conflicts but and ones that sometimes operate independently of each other uh but but the possibility for for them melding into each other as happened in May of 2021 and above all the unpredictability 
there is no uh, there is no way that uh, you know people can kind of game out with any certainty what's going to happen if there's a flare up in Jerusalem. Does it stop there? Does it spread to rocket fire um, of, of from from Gaza? Does it spread to the West Bank? Um, and that sort of thing. Even Israeli policy right now is is unpredictable. There's just a large element of 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 unpredictability uh, in this, and that is an inherently unstable situation. Uh, it seems to me. The idea that this could set off a string of international crises that will force international attention, I think, is is very real, but it will come at a time and a place of nobody's choosing. And that's not that's not a healthy situation. Thank you very much um, for 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 this overview of of of, of the international dimensions and and, and your views. Um, we're moving now in, in Q and A, uh, and yeah, we have received uh, some uh, some interesting questions, and I received uh, some uh, some uh, before uh, as well. Um, so I'll I'll ask uh, uh, just the three questions. Uh, first one to uh, Noah and uh, to Noah Schusterman. This is a question from Abraham. Sprar again, what is the future of uh, uh, Palestinian Authority Israel uh, security cooperation, if there is uh, uh, any future in that? We have said that, that yeah, it, that there is uh, this project of liquidating almost the, the Palestinian Authority. So what, uh, what do you see uh, in that future? Um, to Dr. Brown, what, uh, uh, speaking about uh, what, uh, uh, pressures or incentives the US and the EU can put on, on Israel? Um, should the US condition uh, military aid uh, to Israel? And, uh, and to Khaled El-Gindi, um, can you uh, tell us a bit more about the galaxy of the Palestinian insurgency and becoming more and more uh, fragmented with different uh, uh, resistance groups and this erosion of the Palestinian Authority. Um, what, what, what does the, well, how, how do you see that uh, going forward? Um, first to you, uh, Noah Schusterman. Thank you. you you're muted. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Very um, high tech uh, studio here. <laughs> um, so a very good question about the future of uh, Israeli-Palestinian security coordination. So it's worth saying that really at the moment, there is no security coordination, at least not do you ready. Uh, so about two weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken, there was um, an event uh, in uh, Janine um, the Israeli uh, excursion into Jenin, um, uh, going against um, terrorist cells. This really escalated um, and act took the life of uh, nine Palestinians um, who died during this operation. Uh, of course, a lot of criticism from the Palestinian side against the Palestinian Authority. Because again, it's worth reminding us that this is area A. Within area A, we have the Palestinian security apparatuses who are supposed to be in charge of security. And what happens is that uh, when Israel does excursion in, into area A, the Palestinian security apparatuses, um, they have this coordination mechanism that actually they take a step, step back and they let the, the IDF uh, do whatever operation they need to do. And then as uh, the IDF uh, withdraws, uh, the passing security apparatuses return. Um, but ever since I mentioned the um, breaking waves, as Israel did more and more operations within area A, the Palestinian security apparatuses has really become an active in, this, in, in these areas. Uh, drawing a lot of criticism from the Palestinians against the Palestinian Authority for allowing this to happen, uh, for really taking the step back and allowing the IDF to enter freely um, into these Palestinian areas. Um, and after the event in Janine two weeks ago, um, the Palestinian Authority has declared that it is severing the um, uh, security coordination. 
whether or not this actually happens, um, it's too easy to say because we still haven't seen really any clashes. So the um, uh, the threat of this uh, event of not having coordination, what it means is actually that when the IDF wants to enter into uh, territory within the West Bank, it might encounter um, and have clashes with the Palestinian security apparatuses, which are then present on the scene. Um, we haven't seen that happen. And last time that there was a severance of ties, so this happened in 2020, um, Israel then announced that it's, it wants to um, annex parts of the West Bank. Um, the Palestinian Authority then has declared that it's severing ties. And for six months, there was no security coordination. Now that we, after the fact, and now that we've seen it, uh, there's uh, enough time has passed, then we actually, when we take a look back at what has happened during that time, is that some of the trends, um, and basically these group of the Lions Den and Tanzim groups that were dormant and al uh, uh, Brigade. So these groups have actually really um, gained momentum by the absence of the security coordination. Because security coordination at the end of the day means sharing intelligence, uh, doing shared operations. Um, and many times it was actually in the passing security apparatus's best interest to really um, sometimes even ask the IDF to uh, take on an operation that it was unpopular for the Palestinian leadership to do itself. Uh, because there are a lot of issues of, you know, um, um, you know, within the groups, within the parties, Fatah, Hamas, uh, Hamurot. Um, so it was within the interest of the Palestinian security apparatus is to have to kind of take advantage of the security coordination. At the moment, as I've said, there is no coordination, at least not um, a declared one. Uh, there was a question of whether or not the mechanisms themselves are actually set because there has been 20 years of really close coordination. So sometimes you don't really need to, um, you know, you don't need to have it declared, but it actually happens because the system is used to doing things in a certain way. Um, that's one thing. But looking from the um, maybe a bit of a wider lens on what is, um, right-wing groups would like to see in the future when they look at the uh, Palestinian Authority. Yes, they do not want to see the Palestinian security apparatuses. Um, they want to see the IDF controlling the entire territory. And I think the easiest um, sort of example that we can see is Smotrich. He wrote, um, um, I'm not sure what's the translation to English of his plan, but he basically, he has an entire um, vision of having small autonomies, basically the Palestinian governance would turn into um, restricted autonomies that are disconnected, that they are not part of a Palestinian authority, uh, they are under Israeli control, and they, that would be his vision and the vision that he's now trying to implement. There are many issues with this vision and within the security establishment in Israel, this is not seen as something that's feasible or even um, desirable. So I would say that um, one of the other obstacles to um, the implementation of these uh, very extravagant visions by the Israeli right, as I said before, it's one of them is the Supreme Court. The other one is the security establishment, which sees things uh, much more I would say vividly and, and, and very connected to and very pragmatic um, and realizes that at the end of the day, if you want to, um, to have calm and you have, want to have stability, um, then you need a, a functioning and effective Palestinian authority. And that's within Israel's best interest in terms of security. Um, and I, I can expect that we can see a clash in, for that reason, the um, Israeli right, uh, these uh, Smotrich and Benvi really wanted to have more security control because they want to be able to influence the security establishment from within and really have their way to influence and, and you know, move aside all these obstacles that they have 
um, to implementing their vision. Thank you very much. This was very, very clear. Dr. Brown, over to you. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a great question, and it has two easy answers that appear to be contradictory, but I think are growing less so. Uh, you know, can or uh, can the United States um, essentially change Israel's calculate a uh, calculus? Um, and 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 so the easy first answer is, of course, it can. Um, it's not simply the amount of, of aid that the United States gives Israel. It is an extremely close security cooperation, intelligence cooperation. And it's also the, the United States diplomatically shielding Israel from international fora, from international law, Geneva Conventions, and, and, and so on. Uh, were the United States to put that on the table, uh, uh, Israeli leaders would have to think very, very long and hard about about their policies. So yes, it would have it would have major effect. And the other answer is, you know, um, will the United States do it? And 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 the answer would seem to be that's never been on the table, never. Uh, but I think that might be shifting, not immediately, but in ways that if I were an Israeli leader, I'd be deeply, deeply concerned about. It's shifting on a generational level here in the United States, so that discussions that I have with people who are under thirty are very different than those. Um, um, uh, when I when I talk to people who are over fifty, um, it's shifting on a partisan level, um, and um, um, and I I I, I think uh, that's important. And the um, last Israeli election and the current Israeli government and the kinds of debates that that uh, uh, Noah has been uh, talking about, I think, are deeply shocking, even to many of those who are deeply invested on the American side in the American-Israeli relationship. So I think the idea of certainly the, it, under the current administration of adopting a fairly hard-nosed policy is, is is it is just not going to happen with this administration. Uh, but the idea of a future a future administration, um, especially a democratic one, um, putting things on the table that have never been or that haven't been, you know, really since uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower as president. I think that is possible, um, and 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 I think again when when was talking about the debate, you know, between uh, Netanyahu and and the and, and and the more extreme members of the coalition, the Israeli security establishment. I think long range that has got to be part of their calculations that that, that they will undermine that relationship. Thank you very much. Khaled El Gindi, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I think as a by way of preface, I, I would say uh, in terms of these armed groups, you know, one of the one of the central failings of the Oslo process is that there is there is no, and it's pretty remarkable if you if you think about it, there is no actor or mechanism in place whose job it is to protect Palestinians from either the Israeli army or from uh, Israeli settlers. Security cooperation that we, that we heard about was really about protecting Israelis, whether soldiers or settlers uh, in the occupied territories from Palestinian attacks or whatever. Um, uh, and of course, Palestinian police, uh, the security forces, their job is to protect Palestinians and their property from, you know, criminal uh, uh, activity or violence against each other, but th th that that gaping hole uh, of 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 you know there is there is no mechanism to protect the occupied population from the occupying power was simply never part of part of Oslo, and I think the reality is that there's actually an incentive for these ad hoc groups. Um, to to enter the fray, who see themselves as protectors of uh, you know Palestinian communities, albeit on a local level, um, and since the PA security forces are required, um, anytime the Israeli army goes into Area A, they're required to retreat, um, uh, and so they're they're not allowed to get involved. And I think uh, uh, that creates an incentive for armed groups. To, to emerge, right? Because as we said, you know, military occupation is coercive by definition. It is, it is, it is systemic. It's a form of systematic violence. Um, the, 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 the landscape of these armed groups is still, I think, pretty, um, is pretty unclear. I mean, we know there are certain groups uh, uh, in, in the Northern West Bank. Um, probably we can imagine that there are 
the uh, the um, cells uh, that are going to emerge in southern West Bank, in places like like Hebron. For the time being, um, we have these these armed groups who are independent of political actors, you know, even though they include elements of different factions like Hamas and Islamic Jihad and Al-Aqsa martyrs uh, who are Fatah affiliated, there isn't a central command that can, can rein them in uh, as part of some political process or initiative. And so that's the real danger here. And, and, and I, think, I think we're likely to see more of these, these ad hoc um, uh, armed groups that come that will necessarily come at the expense of of Palestinian uh, security forces, right? Because where there is a vacuum, um, these these uh, these groups emerge, and at the same time, uh, as we said, you know, PA security services don't enter uh, these areas, so they're actually shrinking in terms of the the scope of of places that they uh, that they cover. But there is not uh, there isn't a central cohesive, uh, organized uh, kind of uh, military, uh, even at a coordination level between these, these different groups yet. I mean, that we may see that in, in the coming months or years, but, but right now I think it's still very ad hoc and very uh, uncoordinated. Thank you very much. And this um, actually is an interesting uh, and worrisome trend that we see globally in, uh, in, in our research program about the proliferation of non-state armed groups, uh, the absence of, uh, of central command, and how the landscape of armed groups, of non-state armed groups, becomes more, more, more and more unclear, and, and how that contributes greatly to actually the protractedness of, of conflict. Um, we have time for one last question, and I would like to ask uh, just uh, Nathan Brown about uh, um, the effects of the Abraham Accords. Uh, and we know about the normalization of Israel with uh, uh, several of the uh, Arab uh, neighbors. How is that reflecting on the conflict? How are those uh, Arab neighbors seeing the conflict with the Palestinians today? Um, I think, you know, the countries that signed uh, agreements uh, with Israel and established relations sort of made a decision. Um, and that was that um, they were willing to deal with 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 Israel. It wasn't necessarily saying that 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 the Palestinian cause was absolutely irrelevant, but it wasn't going to be the dominant factor in bilateral relations. That comes under pressure a little bit. Um, these are not uh, uh, regimes, for the most part, that are worried about losing the next election, but it comes under a little bit of pressure at times when there is uh, you know, act, actual violence, uh, and uh, or when there are Israeli moves towards annexation and so on. So I think the uh, the 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 effect is not uh, major. It does, I think. Uh, this may be a question more for for uh, uh, Noah than for me, but I would say it does play in actually to Israeli politics a little bit in the sense that the idea of expanding them, especially to Saudi Arabia, is one that is very attractive to some within the Israeli government and therefore don't rock the bro boat, don't go to formal annexation at this time, you know, try to try to contain the conflict uh, versus those who, who who see this as a golden opportunity uh, to annex. So, so it plays in a little bit there. And I think it plays in a little bit in Palestinian politics as sort of a sense that um, the international system has abandoned us. Um, even countries that used to be our friends have abandoned us. Therefore, we've got to take matters in our own hand. And that might be, uh, it, you know, it might be international solidarity movements, like, you know, BDS, or it could be even what, what, what Khaled described as sort of a lone wolf attack. So I think it kind of raises the temperature for Palestinians without necessarily offering them viable options. Um, uh, but it doesn't it doesn't fundamentally transform the conflict. It, it accentuates trends that were already in, in, in evidence. Thank you very much. Um, we have put a lot on the table. I want to thank very much our speakers, Noah Schusterman, Khaled El Gindi, Nathan Brown, and thank you very much to our audience. Goodbye. <laughs>